All right, you guys. So welcome back. I have like a good friend of mine here, uh, Warren Williams, joining me all the way from the UK. Okay, so we had mm -hmm. to we had to make time zone transitions and everything, but I'm happy to have him here. And as you guys know, based on the last uh, couple of my podcasts, the theme of this year was just focusing on creating kind of lasting change and why that is so rare to see in a lot of people. So as I mentioned before, you know, you have a lot of people that do successfully lose weight, but then end up, you know, 80 to 90% of them about end up regaining all of that weight within a three to four year period. And it's the same thing with a lot of health issues. You know, some people solve one health issue, either that same health issue comes back like a few years later, or like a new health issue comes back like a few years later. And it's like, you're constantly, it seems like people are constantly just chasing one symptom after another symptom after another symptom and not really optimizing their vitality and just health in, in any way or aesthetics as well. And I did mention like a few numbers that I'll just briefly touch on here in the US, kind of like close to 800,000 Americans are dying every year from heart attacks alone. Nine out of 10 American adults right now are metabolic, considered metabolically unhealthy. And, um, you know, countless, countless are dying from like 50% of Americans develop cancer within their lifetime and half of them die from it. And then also even with more recent events, I mean, depending on uh, how you evaluate the numbers, and I know there's a lot of debate about this, but, you know, close to a million Americans have uh, died from, from COVID and about 85 plus percent of those uh, that needed to be hospitalized due to complications from COVID um, had various health issues already and were extremely overweight, et cetera. So I, you can make the argument that, oh, you know, 80, uh, 850,000 of those lives could have been saved if just the country had more metabolic health. And in particular, probably not such a heavy reliance on like symptom management strategies for health support. So this happens a lot um, on overdrive in the medical or the health industry, for, I would say. But also, I do see it oftentimes in the holistic and fitness industries as well. So I was just wondering, I'm going to let you take over here, Warren. And I was just wondering how, you know, how the health of the country in the UK is going and just your perspective on the situation of why it's just so hard to find someone, A, that's actually like optimizing their mental and physical health and B, someone that actually has a complete resolution to whatever health issue or aesthetic issue they might be suffering from. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is... um that you know especially like the fact that in the western world we have something like at the last count something like fifteen thousand different books on, on diet means that we don't know what the right diet is to have fifteen thousand different opinions on diet it just means that we don't know what's the right thing to do you know when we look at the animal kingdom so take it back a little bit we as humans are so proud of what we think we know based on you know the technology and i've got an ipad and, and you know, and iPod and all these sort of things, um, these luxuries and conveniences. But, you know, something that, you know, someone we both know, Paul Check always says, you know, we're learning more and more about less and less until we know absolutely nothing. And so what we're seeing now in, in the world is the example of how what we think we know is unsustainable. The fact that so many people are obese, you will never go into the animal kingdom and walk around and say, you'll, these words will never come out of your mouth. Look at that fat deer walking by. You'll never say that because in the animal kingdom, they are in total balance with functionality and survival at its optimum level. So it's like, just think about it, go into nature, you will never see a fat deer. You'll never see a fat, you, know, you could probably argue that bears look kind of fat, but you know what I mean? Like they're not overweight, they're at their optimum because nature has dictated that. But because of the conveniences that we love in the Western world now, those conveniences that we think are supporting us are actually hindering us. An example to that going, you know, and we're going to move to this point about obesity, but it's all around this convenience. Going back into this whole convenience thing, so many people have um, air-conditioned houses when it's too hot. They have heated floors when it's too cold. They have double glaze and insulation all these sort of things that make them have a really cushy life so that arterial vascular tree doesn't need to upregulate or downregulate temperature. Animals don't have that. And so based on climate, animals become stronger because of specific stresses that they go through. And as you know, your humans in their, in their avoidance of pain to try to improve convenience, 
have weakened their body's natural defenses to be able to improve based on stress. And it's the same with um, exercise. Humans are inherently nowadays in the Western world trying to find ways to mitigate pain in different ways. And part of that is I don't want to exercise because it hurts too much. So they've got such a, a psychology now of being protected in every single way. If they have a virus, take a drug. If, they're, if they can't sleep, take a sleeping tablet and all these different things. If I'm cold, put on a jumper. And all these sort of things are taken away from the inherent drive for us to actually improve ourselves physically. And so part of all of that relates to where we're at right now where humans are overweight because again there's no way you could survive in caveman times being overweight um you know i remember i saw a cartoon once and um i was watching it with my nephew and he was it was funny there's a scene where there was a guy saying i can't play football i'm really old i'm 35 <laughs> you know it's like 35 is not old but in those days 35 is old because you have to be so virile you have to be so strong and as you know like just things like with um, the army, in order for you to get into the army, the criteria for health and fitness has changed in the last 30, 40 years because they know that most people wouldn't even fit the criteria to go into starting training mm -hmm. to, um, you know, to get into the army. You know, things like um, back in the Middle Ages in the 15th century and stuff, people used to travel two, 300 miles on foot to then start a war. I was like, are you crazy? With you equipment. Walk, like, that's heavy. With a, you know, exactly. <laughs> chain mails. And yeah. they didn't have, you know, hovercrafts and all these things. To your point, they didn't get dropped into a country by a parachute. And so they would travel hundreds of miles. And that would probably take, you know, two weeks just to get to a battle and then fight for a week. We were so much stronger back then because of the stresses. So the conveniences, and to my point, you know, is that the conveniences that we have in nowadays and our mentality to avoid things and be protected by the governments of the world from stress has made us physiologically weak. And that's why we're suffering right now. It's the byproduct of the avoidance of stress that is making us become more stressed in that sense. Well, do you feel like one of the obstacles, um, like obviously, like how long have you been a coach for, Warren? Uh, since 2000, no, 1997, since 1997. Okay, so quite a while, you know, like people like you and I obviously have invested like a lot of time and also money in educating ourselves on mental health, physical health, spiritual health, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So we got kind of like a different lens of how to look for help and oftentimes can find the right help pretty quickly uh, if we're having like any issues, et cetera, et cetera, or just want to learn a new way of solving the same problem. Mm -hmm. But I feel like looking at it from the vantage point of like an average consumer. So you got like an average consumer. They're like, uh, you know, 20, 25, 30% body fat, probably somewhere around there, like yeah. very overworked, have gut issues, uh, mo maybe have financial issues, uh, have like a probably a huge disconnect with their core values. So that's causing a lot of micro stresses every single second of the day, basically on their central nervous system. Plus, you know, you got the external environment, the pollutants in the environment, et cetera, et cetera. And I find like one of the, one of the, challenges in terms of why you never see lasting help uh, help is oftentimes even if a person from that state generally does want to seek out help i mean look what their options are because remember they don't have like a lot of that education even or even yeah. time or energy to invest in that education mm -hmm. to see a clearer picture of what real help actually looks like so they're like 90 percent of them will go like okay i just need to go to the doctor right mm -hmm. and the doctor obviously will chat with you for like five ten minutes and they'll give you, you know, some kind of medical, medical drug. Oh, mm. Or they go to like the, even the fitness community. I'm not going to leave them out here too. You know, they go to some 20 person boot camp. you know, they have you sign up, like uh, sign a waiver. And they're like, oh, your only issue is lack of exercise, which in my opinion is the same as saying like a person with, um, uh, with an alcohol problem, for example, just tell him, oh, you just got to stop drinking. Yeah. And the person would be like, Oh, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know, yeah, that's yeah. so obvious. But, yeah. uh, but you know, and then a very small percent will go to the holistic circles. But from my vantage point too, I don't see a lot of people also creating that lasting change in holistic circles. They're a bit higher percentage for sure than the yeah. fitness, and definitely a way higher percentage than the medical community. But it's still kind of hit and miss. So, what's your mm -hmm. what's your take on today's? 
Um, how about in the UK? I don't know too much about the UK healthcare system. Mm -hmm. What's your take on the healthcare system in the UK right now and how they're approaching uh, health problems? Yeah, so I'll touch on that one first and then go back to what you're saying about, you know, the long term and short term stuff that um, people look at in the choices. So the medical system in the UK, you know, the first thing for me that comes up with all of this is, um, you know, this whole concept of in order for you to make money out of health, you have to make people sick. And so we know that's definitely a top down um, point of view. Like you can't like the fact that there's more money. I can't remember the, the numbers, but the, um, there's more money in, in the weight loss industry um, than in the healthcare industry. <laughs> and it's like, it's, you, you know, you have to make people sick for that to be a reality. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, you know, that whole saying that they say, um, if you want to make, you know, you should create the problem and sell the solution, you know, create the problem and sell the solution. So there's definitely a lot of that. So with that, um, the, the welfare system in the UK isn't the same as America. You can go to the hospital and get a heart transplant and not need to pay up front. Um, and, you know, that's part of the system here. They are changing it into more like a system similar to America where you have to pay for everything, but right now you don't. You can go to your dentist pretty much for free. And the only thing you have to pay for is a medicine um, when you go to the pharmacy. So typically, if you're going to the dentist, it's free. Um, and then once they write you the prescription, you'd go downstairs into their pharmacy part and pay the 20 pounds or so for the anti-inflammatories and stuff like that before you go back to the dentist for free. <laughs> You know, so um, I don't know. America is not like that, but there are certain things. Like if you, if you break your arm, you get over, you get it casted, reset for free. Um, but it's only like if you were going to have obviously cosmetic surgery or a heart transplant or brain transplant, then you you're paying money. But there are the lower services that are pretty much free in the UK. But I know they are changing that. But um, so, you know, going back to what you're saying about the long term and short term, yeah, definitely I would put the fitness people in there because for me, the allopathic method and the holistic or alternative, sorry, because most people aren't holistic, even though they throw out the word holistic. I'll just touch on that while I since I've said it. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, I know you know this, but in, with, for the audience, we, the word holistic means whole health. And that means by definition, if you're an acupuncturist, you can't be a holistic acupuncturist. Because by definition, you're a dentist or an acupuncturist, you're a specialist, mm -hmm. not holistic. And so a lot of people are using the word holistic. I'm a holistic dentist. No, you're not a holistic dentist. You don't treat the whole body. You're a biochemical dentist or you're an orthodontic dentist or whatever, but you're not holistic. And, and so because of that, um, most systems are using this word incorrectly. But going back to this whole thing about the allopathic system and an alternative system, I agree with you with that. Um, it's still a this for that approach. So if somebody has low back pain, there isn't enough time invested in the client to figure out the causation of that. And so they're treated the same as if they went to the doctor, they are treating the effect, not the cause. And again, it's because the system is set up that way. Like you said, the medical doctors spend on average three to seven minutes with their patients because they can't spend longer because the system is set up in such a way that people don't take ownership. And because they don't take ownership, there's too many have been turning up to see the doctors. And so the doctors are constantly treating the ramifications of people not being accountable. And so because of that, and because of the fact that most people aren't accountable, they see more patients than they can handle. And so because of that, they have to see them in less time. And so they mm -hmm. can never get to the result. Um, so they're still treating the um, effect. But the allopathic, sorry, the um, alternative, you know, um, Coaches and healers are still treating the effect. Low back pain, I'm going to osteopath, I'm going to treat your low back. So it's still the same thing. It's still short-term fixes. The long-term that we, you know, we are referring to is the education mm -hmm. that the client needs. It's the education that brought them to see the person in the first place. Why did you come here? What choices did you make that made you get this symptom? Which, you know, the word symptom really just means signal from the body to be aware of something to then do something about and so that's lacking in education. And that's the part, obviously, as we know, knowledge is power, but applied knowledge is true power. And that's what's missing. Yeah. And I find like these days, it's, um, it's extremely fine. It's, ex it's extremely hard to find someone that even understands that a lot of this 
pain is just your body's way of telling you, you either need to stop doing what you're doing or just do it com like dramatically differently. It's kind of signals from your body telling you like, dude, this is not okay. And at first, of course, as you know, it starts off with little cries for help, you know? But then if you don't attend to those, they become louder. And then you don't attend to that for even longer, they become even louder. Yeah. And uh, then eventually it's so loud that you have to deal with it. Like you have, yeah. you know, end stage cancer or you definitely have, you know, like a collapsed lower back and you can't even feel your leg anymore or something of that sort, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But what do you feel? What, do you, what would you have to say to people that are like, because a lot of people, I feel especially kind of like the medical community, it sells them false hope by giving them medical drugs. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people, uh, I mean, me and you aren't going to fall for it, obviously, but a lot of people genuinely believe like, okay, so I have high blood pressure, you know, and I go to the doctors and they give me high blood pressure medication and all of a sudden lowers my blood pressure. Mm. All of a sudden I'm cured. Mm. Like a lot of people genuinely believe that, but the biggest thing they're missing, I feel is kind of like, dude, the belief system that led you did the behaviors that led to the high blood pressure are going to also lead to a myriad of other health issues as well. And what are you going to now end up taking 20, 20 different medications, each of which has also a couple of side effects. So by the time you're like 30, 40, you're on like 10, 15, 20 different medications, half of which are just to counter the negative side effects of the other half. Like mm -hmm. what, what what's, what's your take in terms of like, if you're talking to this person and they think, well, you know, this doctor, they went to school for so long, they must know what they're talking about. And yeah. if they wouldn't tell me to do this, if it wasn't the best course of action, because I feel that is genuinely how 90% of people perceive that advice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a great point and um, point of view is, and the thing is, is that um, what people obviously, as we know, are really looking for is permission. <laughs> they're looking for permission to continue the lifestyle that they have. And most people can't change. And so when they go to the doctor to take their drugs is to give them permission to continue to do the same thing. And most people want to do that. And so what we're dealing with, unfortunately, are children. You know, most adults think that they're adults and they're not. They're children. And I always def define the difference. I say there's a difference between growing up and getting older. And most people are just getting older. They're not growing up because growing up is making choices for yourself as an adult. It makes me laugh when I see adults telling children what not to do, yet still do it themselves. Mm -hmm. It just baffles me. Even like, obviously this is sidetracking a lot, but just like one key example would be, you know, a parent would say to a child, don't beep swear while swearing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's just a joke. So, you know, society itself, we're raising children now. And, um, and so because of that, they seek father figures that are, may the doctors have replaced God in their minds and um, because they're on TV and because they wear white coats. And you know, when we look at just um, something I spoke about years ago about marketing the lie, um, white is synonymous with beauty and education and power and all the stuff that the media puts around the color white. And so when they wear these white lab coats, the white color itself is, is um, like angelic and all these terms that they give it. And so that gives them a reference of power and mm -hmm. they have a clipboard and they have a badge and they have a degree and degree itself is what one degree of knowledge is 360 degrees. What about the rest? But we've, so because of all this stuff, obviously, you know, as we know, the society today has learned and been trained by the powers that be to worship doctors. And like you said, most people think that doctors are, um, they are trained to help and they're not, unfortunately, because um, something that Norman Cousins said, a powerful man who was one of Tony Robbins' mentors, who was diagnosed with cancer, terminal cancer, about 40 years ago, and he was given six months to live. He cured himself through laughter and, um, you know, didn't take medical drugs. He just did laughter. He cured himself totally within three months. And so Tony Robbins was asking him um, about the medical system and doctors and where doctors fail. And he said, unfortunately, doctors are educated by their lawyers and that is to avoid malpractice and so they have to be very specific in how they treat people because they don't want to give too much but only enough so they can be safe because they want to avoid getting sued and so the whole system is based on that and then the second part of it is um doctors see so many people they can only do so much 
and they are desensitized um, to emotion, to really get into people's stories. And he said, look, they have to be. To get through medical school, you have to become desensitized. Imagine seeing death every single day. You become desensitized. You just become numb. And so the medical system is based on doctors who may have the best intentions but have been trained to be numb emotionally, energetically, spiritually because of this, the way the system of medical school is. And as we know, doctors spend 7,000 hours in training in medical school, four hours of nutritional training, but yet they give out nutritional advice. It's a joke. Yeah. Well, I feel like uh, in terms of your comment about malpractice, like how's a three to five minute assessment not malpractice, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Or how is uh, not giving... I feel like even a, you know, everything has a place in time, you know, there's a place in time for, for medical drugs too, but like a doctor that cares about you, it, if you really genuinely cared about you, you'd work on deprescribing medication, yeah. not giving you even more medication. And if like, for example, like, Hey, you know, okay, I don't have like the training in holistic health, uh, how to use movement as medicine, nutrition, et cetera. Okay, cool. Well, at least have a portfolio of people that they can reach out to and say to your patient, within the 10 to 15 minutes you talk to them like, hey, we're gonna do this course of action of you know, anti-anxiety medication, but in order to have a complete resolution, you know, you're gonna to have to work on changing the behaviors that led to all these problems to begin with, which isn't gonna happen overnight. So don't put pressure on yourself or anything, but you're gonna to need to see these professionals and ideally read these books to get a good introduction for it or some kind of system of that sort. Um, I just don't understand how it's like you mentioned the the malpractice thing. It's like, dude, how's uh, I find like I just do like three about three hour assessments, and mm. I find sometimes that's not even enough. You know, mm. I feel like sometimes you even need to do more than that just to really get mm. to know, uh, mm. you know, that person's specific issues, their personality that's leading to those issues, their environmental factors that are kind of like fueling the problem of one sort yeah. or another, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And also like another thing you mentioned in terms of. Uh, universal healthcare. And I think the UK's, I mean, I don't know anything about the UK healthcare system, but my prediction is they're probably moving away from that universal coverage system because it's becoming too expensive to support such a sick population. And it's, yeah. the, same exact, it's the same exact thing in the U S like, dude, like all universal healthcare system, all universal healthcare coverage does is basically just cover like drugs, drugs, yeah. drugs, and more drugs. Yeah. And Illegal more yeah. Yeah. And more yeah. symptom management, which is which doesn't work. It doesn't mm. work. It's a complete failure. It gives like a, a short hope that something's yeah. working and then eventually just kind of collapses and actually becomes exponentially a bigger problem. Yeah. And uh, I forgot the costs of the healthcare system here, but it's atrocious. And in my opinion, it's kind of like, why can't we have universal healthcare system? But get this, take a even a small percentage of that budget reinvest it into really like serious healthcare education from elementary school through high school. Yeah. Like college isn't yeah, even yeah. necessary, although it would be yeah, cool yeah. to have that. Yeah. Although it'd be cool to have that there. And I'm talking mm -hmm. about people don't have to be a master. They just have to be kind of like slightly below expert on how to use movement as medicine, how to manage their central nervous system, what real food actually is, how mm -hmm. to identify and live close to their core values, how to have nonviolent forms of communication. Dude, you just teach kids that way and just the health problems will fix yeah. themselves. And then ironically, you can still have this damn universal healthcare system because almost nobody will use it in yeah, case exactly. of emergency. They'll just use it in case of emergencies. So you got exactly. the best of both worlds and you don't have these like, you don't, mm. you don't see the sad sight of having to walk outside and nine out of 10 people you see, I don't know how it is in the UK, but probably the same. It's just like full of obesity, misery and disease. You just see yeah. the pain on their face and on their body, yeah. you know? Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, is um, as they as they say, there's no money in the cure. There's only money in the treatment. And so the medical system isn't really a healthcare system. It's, it's a disease management system or a disease maintenance system. And so people don't want to accept that. And this is the thing. Now, with all the stuff that we're talking about, most people don't want to believe that's true because if it is true, they're going to have to change. Mm -hmm. And most people don't want to change. So because they don't want to change, it can't be true. We must be conspiracy theorists because to believe an alternative point of view means I have to grow up. Mm -hmm. 
most people don't want to grow up. So they have to believe, no, I'm telling you, the doctors are good. And we're not saying doctors are evil. You know, it's not doctors are evil. It's the system that's broken. And doctors are only using the system, as we said, that is based on people that are not accountable and so can only create a certain amount of change. And that change is symptomatic. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, as you said, you know, humans are more than our, our bodies. So if you have an emotional breakdown, as you said, three hour assessment it isn't enough because you can't get into someone's life i mean we both are aware of people that we've probably known for 15 20 years and we still don't know everything about them so is three hours really enough no no there's no way seven minutes is enough so what's the genesis of someone's pain a lot of it is mental emotional because we are mm-hmm. humans that have consciousness and so we know that doctors don't look at that they look at x's and o's literally what's happening with the body not what's happening with the mind and then if they do think there's a, a psychosomatic issue, they will send them to somebody who's a psychologist. And unfortunately, psychology is okay to a degree, but they're still in a system, in, in a closed loop system. They don't look at everything else and then they send them to a knee specialist. That's a closed loop system. And so they keep sending clients or patients, as they like to call them, to closed loop systems not integrating anything and so the person can never get full results because nobody's mm. looking at why one thing created another thing they're looking at their their speciality their niche and that's it yeah i have like two important things to kind of back up exactly what you said because i think it's like really powerful uh you know i said in the beginning um even people that are genuinely looking for help are often misguided by today's syst- like symptom management system but mm. i feel actually a bulk majority of the people it's kind of a it's a uh, reciprocal relationship. Like you mentioned, they don't want to change. So mm-hmm. they're looking for someone that can facilitate that, not wanting to take responsibility and change. Because can you imagine, Even permission. like, can you imagine like you're 35 or 40, mm-hmm. you're, for example, I mean, this could be anyone, but you're like a computer science guy that's working like 50, 60, 70 hour weeks at a high pressure job. You know, you're very overweight, you're very unhealthy. It's, it's your whole identity, you know? So if you lose that, not only do you lose your financial security, but you lose like basically who you identified with probably for four decades of your life. And can you imagine like a doctor saying like, you can't keep living this way Mm. if if you want to actually regain your health or something of that sort, how difficult that would be to accept. But what if they say like, Hey, you have excessive anxiety and okay, here's uh, some ex- anti-anxiety medication here's some high blood pressure to control that high blood pressure of yours you know you have that back pain from sitting too long okay here's some painkillers as well you can take daily and stuff of that sort all of a sudden the person's like relieved because they're like Whew, mm-hmm. yeah. i don't have to look in the mirror and admit to myself that i'm the one causing my problems and i feel like like you're totally right and i do see that oftentimes because it's scary to first take responsibility and let your ego go to the side and admit that, well, shit, Mm -hmm. I did cause all these problems, Mm -hmm. but I think it's also powerful too. And I got this from, uh, Brian Carroll. Mm -hmm. And, um, because if, if you're causing all your problems, you can stop causing all your problems. (laughs) And that's like super powerful. Although I think like you mentioned also, just unfortunately, a lot of people, want independence but in reality being truly independent and free is Mm. extremely frightening having true freedom so i think they're in the mindset of like uh i kind of want to be told what to do but told what to do in a way that makes me believe i wanted to do it all along to begin with to not uh, to avoid basically anyway so yeah i totally um yeah yeah totally agree with that I mean, just one one last thing, just to add to what you said as well. Um, something I always teach my clients is that most people do want to change; they just don't want to be changed. Mm-hmm. That's challenge, you know, they don't want to be told what to do; they want to figure it out themselves. But oftentimes, they don't because <laughs> of all the stuff that you just mentioned. So, yeah, yeah. Like I always, uh, I I kind of find it funny sometimes when people are like, for example, the majority of people, if something breaks in their car, they're like. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah. They go to the mechanic. They're like, well, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't have the time for it. I'm going to go to someone that knows what they're doing and they're going to fix my car. But when their body breaks, a lot of times people are like, oh, all of a sudden I'm an expert and I'm going to know what to do. Although the human body and mind are 
like monumentously way more complicated mm. than the car. Mm. And I find like, dude, there are only two options for uh, like the general population to really see a good resolution is a, the most, um, the easiest one, which if you find the right mentor could be a huge benefit, such as yourself, for example, um, hire a mentor mm. that has a long track record of success and also lives true to their principles themselves. And you're literally, that's your option. And your literally only other option is you could become your own mechanic, but it's a long road. You know, be ready to at least start reading three to four books every month, doing a couple courses a year. And eventually you'll find out that you still have to hire mentors anyways to kind of connect the dots or accelerate the process for you in certain areas here and there. And that's it. Those are your two options. So if you're listening to this podcast and you really are looking for like a complete resolution of whatever you're struggling with, Option A, hire a mentor. Option mm. B, become your own mechanic, but be ready to actually spend quite a bit of money on doing that and a lot of time and conscious effort on doing that as well. And that's it. And if you don't do either of those, you know, you can you can get all drugged up and everything, but hey, you know, take an honest look at yourself in the mirror and, you know, those saggy, saggy boobs, that gut, you know, looking aged and worse and worse year after year, feeling worse. Like if all that shit worked, how come, how come you feel worse and look worse than you ever exactly. have before? Yeah. That's, yeah. I'm sorry to break it to you, but just, I feel yeah. sugarcoating doesn't help people stuck in that cycle. It's been yeah. done too long and it's not helping them at all. It's just continuing their cycle of misery, obesity, and disease. So I just, I have to say it because it's kind of painful to see that. And then unfortunately, if they do have their kids there, they teach their kids to do the exact same thing. Maybe not broken, but mother. hey. 80% yeah. eighty percent of what kids learn from their parents is by observation. Mm. So if you're very overweight, you're taking all these medical drugs, they're drugs, okay? Some people call it medicine to disguise it that way, but there are drugs with mm. yeah. side effects. Nothing yeah. is free, okay? You will have side effects if you continue to take mm. them long enough. Mm. And you're teaching your kids to be the same exact way. And if mm. you're miserable and you not looking the way you like to look, you look sick, you look worn out, haggard, many years older than you actually are. Well, guess what? What are the chances of your kids ending up the same exact way? Extremely, extremely high. I yeah. don't know. Like, um, do you have kids at all, Warren? No, no. But I'm what? around children. Well, I spend like three days a week with my nephew all the time. So I see it. But how does that make you feel? It kind of like hurts me sometimes. And I kind of would personally classify that as like a form of child abuse. Definitely. Yeah. Um, just, I wanted to say one thing actually, just before we uh, actually answer that, but, um, going back to your point about hiring people to, um, you know, cut the line almost in a sense, I've just finished a business course this week and, um, with, um, Tony Robbins actually. And one of the things that they were saying is, um, entrepreneurs pay a check for speed. <laughs> and it's like so simple. They pay a check for speed, which means they hire someone to know mm -hmm. faster. And so to your point with that. If you don't know and you can't commit that level of time to understand, hire someone who does. Like they say, it's like, I remember the film Deja Vu with Denzel Washington and he was talking about time travel. And he, he was like, someone gave him a reference. And he goes, look, I don't need to understand how to do it. I just know how to use it. Press a button when it comes to a yeah. phone. I don't know how to make a phone. I don't know how to use a phone, you know, design a phone, but I just know how to use it. And so <clears throat> with us, it's like, if you don't know how to do it, find someone who does you don't need to understand just find someone who does understand and that's how you improve health but yeah to your point with the um you know the children it is sad because you know when it comes to um societies we're always supposed to evolve and the previous generation is supposed to be a weaker version of the next because we're supposed to learn more same way how we're talking about with hiring a mentor to fast track information you know so even this is an example, me and you, as we've been coaching for years, we've made mistakes in our coaching and we found better ways of coaching people. Mm -hmm. When we mentor people, we know that experience. We tell them, don't make that mistake, do this. And so we are helping that new coach to cut five years of mistakes, but we had to have gone through the mistakes to figure out what doesn't work, to fine tune it. And so that example is what's supposed to happen with our parents saying, don't make the mistake I did, don't marry someone for money because I did that. Teach that to my child to not make that mistake. And the child becomes wiser. And the same with don't eat too much sugar. I did that and I've got diabetes. Do this instead. And the child gets smarter. Don't not exercise and so on and so on. 
And so that child is supposed to be an improved version of their parents. And then when that child has children, that's another improved version. That's how we're supposed to evolve. But the fact that there is now a point where um, children are dying sooner than their parents, and not because they're getting into gang fights, but just because they're making worse choices than their parents, because 25 years ago, there wasn't as much sugar on the planet to consume, and there wasn't 24-hour TV and all that sort of stuff. We are de-evolving. That's not correct, and that is sad to see. I see it, to your point, you know, and um, I, I see people um, around a lot with their children that aren't wise enough to make decisions, and, you know, I see children that get jabbed and all this sort of stuff, and like, but you don't need it. And then, you know, you see, I, you know, I've known stories of people that have died, children that have died from getting jabbed and stuff like that, and it's because their parents didn't have wisdom enough to actually research the information to see if it's actually okay for their child that's painful children that get um you know autoimmune diseases at a young age because they're eating crap because their parents haven't got enough education and it's sad because you know to your point a baby opens its mouth and waits for food to come in it doesn't know if it's good or bad for it it trusts that the parents know mm -hmm. and sadly most parents don't know just like children getting um tooth extractions because their parents don't know any better or getting um, bloody mercury fillings because their parents don't know any better. And that's sad for me because I'm like, I feel so bad for you, child, because you're trusting that your parents have the wisdom to make the right decisions for you that you can't make at this time. And that's sad. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's one thing you mentioned about, you know, the, the vaccine and everything. One thing I found super comical is like, I don't know how it was in the UK that the same amount of idiocy exists there as, as it does in the U S but you have people like on social media, they're like, Oh, bragging about when they got the vaccine and they're taking a picture, oh, yeah. like a selfie in a rest in a fast food restaurant or eating a donut while they're like 30 or 40 pounds overweight. Listen, dude, here's the, here's the truth. Like, uh, Basically, I mean, uh, I forgot the exact numbers, but your chances of dying from complications from COVID, at least in the U.S., were like 0. 0.001%. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But exactly. here, here are real numbers that, once again, people ignore because they ignore because they don't want to take responsibility that they're causing their own pain. And here they are. So let's say you go to, at least these are the numbers in the U.S. At least you you go to, uh, let's say you go to lunch with four with three friends. So it's you and three other friends. Okay, so two of you will develop cancer and one of you will die from it. Mm. One of you will die from a heart attack. So 50% of you, two, mm. two out of the four in the whole entire group will die of very preventable diseases, like mm. super preventable. I'm like, you don't have to be even an expert. You just have to have a ground level understanding of basic okay. health principles to avoid these things. And that's 50%. You're not worried about 50%, but you're worried about 0.001%. Like, dude, yeah. how fucking dumb are you? And in that case, if that person is that dumb, they really deserve the level of misery and obesity they have in their life. And yeah. I just kind of hope they just don't have kids in their life because it would be very sad for me to see them pass those ideas. Yeah. And because a lot of people don't understand, but the deadliest virus of all is a belief system that doesn't facilitate health conscious choices Correct. because that belief that vi that belief system spreads like a virus it spreads yeah. from person to person yeah. infects the person and mm -hmm. kills the person and most likely damages the environment around the person because yeah. if a person is generally like very health conscious they also ironically respect the environment around them yeah. where vice versa if a person's not like look how much trash you see outside of like a mcdonald's typically for example you know but i don't see any trash outside of like a regenerative beef operation yeah, yeah you know right. just to give you a very like arbitrary random example but what do you think uh, as a random practitioner side note you mentioned you took some business classes and what do you think about this whole paradigm of like um kind of specialist versus generalist you know because it's tempting sometimes to go into like the specialist category, even for business purposes, you know, because it makes it easier for you to, to market yourself, like try to, like you have a variety of skills, you probably have like an equivalent of multiple like master's degrees, and maybe one, mm -hmm. one or two PhD degrees. But it's like, you got to say like, oh, I could do this, 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 you know what I mean? And a lot of people can't wrap their head around that. 
Yeah. Hey, you know, the car has many moving parts that all have to work in tandem with one another at appropriate qualities. And the same thing with the human being. But I find um, I find it it is easier from a business perspective to kind of like yes, advertise agree. yourself as a specialist. You yeah, know? I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So um, like you said, you know, I've been studying up a lot on this stuff in, in recent years. There's definitely this whole thing about the dot. What's the dot or the niche or the avatar, different statements that people use. And so when I'm coaching a lot of chat practitioners that I mentor, one of the things I always say to them is the problem with you guys is you do too many things. And they say, huh? And I said, that's a problem because you're starting to sell 17 different things that you do. And so the consumer doesn't know what you're specializing in for them. So the main thing is you have to identify what all of your skills are creating as a single result. And what's the one single result you want to start to push as a business? Because oftentimes, especially in the wellness field, what we're marketing is our skills and our Customers don't care about our skills. They care about the result that they are wanting to buy from you. Mm -hmm. And so when you sit there and, and you, you market yourself based on your skill, you say, hi, I am John. I can do back pain and knee pain. And that's just skill set. What's the end result of all of that for me? Ah, uh, pain resolutions. Why don't you just say pain resolution and done? No one cares what you do. They care what you can do for them. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. And so that has to be niched down and specialized. Not the skill sets, but the result of your skill sets. That's the niche. That's the um, the you know the, the specialization that you want to focus on. Yeah. Well, we talked. We covered uh, quite a bit about like the medical industry, for example. But another avenue that people seek out help for, and I hate to say, unfortunately, because there are a lot of great accounts out there as well, although they're far in between, maybe one and two or three hundred. But a lot of people seek out social media influencers for help these days, oh. also. And I don't know, I'm going to let you take over here, but <laughs> what would you tell the average consumer to be wary of and to kind of look for some red flags and stuff of that sort? Because um, I find like social media influencers, even when they're very competent, it only works for you if you're already very competent yourself too and know how to fit that into the context of your situation. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Whatever advice they're kind of giving out. But if you don't have that knowledge, you lose context. And then yeah. it's like the equivalent of like, me handing a book to you of how to construct a car, all the answers are in that book, no doubt. And they're in plain English. But how many people do you think would be able to build a car from scratch, even with all the answers there? Almost mm. no one. I know I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, hell no, not me either. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's so much to this with um, so with um, influencers. There's some, this, okay. Going back to what you were saying earlier about people not being able to think um, to make the right You good? Yep. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things, um, as you were talking about before with people and the vaccines and stuff like that, what we were really looking at is people stuck at what we call concrete thinking. And so because they're stuck at concrete... And so we were looking at um, concrete thinking. And so when we look at concrete thinking, you know, to your point about vaccines and the viruses and stuff and people not being able to think for themselves... We're at a point <clears throat> where, you know, people are stuck at this concrete thinking stage. And concrete thinking, for those who don't know, is um, <clears throat> a child, when it's born, it's stuck at concrete thinking, where it only sees whatever it sees as real. It doesn't know anything or any context behind it. It's an example. Is if you have a rabbit, and you see this a lot, a magic trick where you put a rabbit into a hat. Us as humans know that the hat's three-dimensional and the rabbit's probably been put in a little hole, but the child believes that that rabbit has actually disappeared. If you put a rabbit in front of a child and then put a cloth in front of it, the child believes that, that rabbit has disappeared. It doesn't understand the cloth's just obscuring the vision because it can't conceptualize beyond that point. So it's stuck at concrete thinking, which basically means believe what you see. Do not question, believe what you see. Eventually, a child gets to the point of the abstract thinking where they push the towel out of the way and say, oh, look, there's the rabbit. And so to that point, most humans are at concrete thinking. They haven't gotten to the point of critical thinking. And so that's where their problem lies with regards to what we're talking about with humans and just um, being able to make correct choices and analyze things correctly. You know, they're stuck at um, 
the concrete thinking stage and I've actually forgotten what we were relating it to just now. Could you just remind me of what your point was before? Uh, fitness, uh, health oh, influencers, influencers, fitness yeah. influencers, social media influencers. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and so with the whole thing with influencers, because people are stuck at concrete thinking, they believe if you're on TV, you're an expert. If you have a um, mass amount of followers, it's only because what you're saying is the truth. And so that gives these influencers a tremendous amount of power. And so these influencers are able to influence many, hence the word. So people believe them without, as you say, you know, leading to your point, discernment. And so karmically, you know, from a karmic law point of view, these people that are speaking about things that they are aware they don't truly understand or have the true wisdom of these influencers, they are giving people opinions without any research or any, any um, critical thinking behind what they're saying. And these people, because they're children, the followers are children, are easily influenced. An example I was given was um, when someone was talking about um, your president, you know, well, I know he's not your president, but the president of America, um, Biden, and how one of his influences, is it Cardi B? I think well, probably her name, Cardi B. Anyway, she's got, I don't know, 14 million followers or whatever it is. And she said, vote for Biden. And um, actually it was Candace Owens that was actually talking about her and said that um, Cardi B had done no research on Biden as to why you should or shouldn't vote for him. But because people, this is what Candace Owens was saying, because people like Cardi B's music, which has nothing to do with politics, they voted for the person that she picked without any discernment or any understanding of the, the information behind her choice. She just said, pick Biden, and 14 million people went and voted for Biden. That's dangerous because now you're leading masses of people to make a choice for their life mm. without even knowing if that person has done their due diligence. That's dangerous. And that's one of the examples of why um, influencers in general are so dangerous. I mean, an influencer will say, get a sports drink. And you'll get it because you like that person, but you don't have mm. to it. So it's just terrible. Yeah. I also find like to a lot of times to become popular, um, Joseph Goebbels, he's like a propagandist from uh from Germany. And he always said, like, to influence the masses, your message has to resonate with the dumb with the dumbest follower in your category. Mm. So in a sense, you gotta like dumb down your message and make it more emotionally charged or emotionally yeah. driven. And the thing, at least how it relates to health, whether it be physical or mental health, is there are no absolutes. That's it. Like, as you know, uh, novel, uh, nature is a novelty generator. Right? There's yeah. no like two specks of grain, uh, sands of uh, grain that are the same. No two, mm. two snowflakes that are the same. No mm. two droplets of water that are the same, especially no two people that are the same. Mm. And I mm. feel to gain that kind of like following on social media you have to state things as absolutes like this is the way and it's simple it's a b and that's it you know and that's just that's alone like very dangerous because the like for example you could have two people that are you know both 35 year old white males both the same height even let's say they're twins and both are 20 pounds overweight but the reason they gained those 20 pounds is completely different although objectively they're exactly the same person and thus, mm. your approach for them has to be completely different to come to a resolution. And if they're hearing this message like, oh, you just have to do this, you know what I mean? Mm. And it's like, that's it. Yeah, that's that's kind of dangerous. And also just like, even if they are a really good, they're giving out great information, you know? Just the mm. thing is, that person has never met you. Mm. In your situation, although it might, you might be having that same problem, like we explained with that 20-pound excessive body fat example, just the origin is never known of what yeah. led to that. So that how that's like the equivalent of like, for example, showing up to the doctor's office and they don't even talk to you and they're like, here, take this medication. Exactly. You're like, whoa, dude, you don't even know what's going on with yeah. me. What the hell? <laughs> like, what, what are you giving me? It's that it's easy to fall into that when you don't know about the subject already. But if like, for example, if you go cruise around online, it actually will be probably helpful for you because you know how to quickly wash away the, the stupid information and really catch on to the good information, then know how to use that good information in your context. Cause you already have like two plus decades of 
rigorous, uh, rigorous education yourself mm -hmm. and are mm -hmm. able to do that. But I'm saying I'm speaking in the from the vantage point of just an average consumer. It's mm -hmm. a disaster. And mm -hmm. most most oftentimes they're like, oh, it's simple. And then always at the end, they're like, buy this supplement or buy this gadget. You know what I mean? There's always that kind of like hook at the end of their most of their messages, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the things as well that, you know, I, I wanted to share with that as well is they, with the doctors, um, I always say to people, <laughs> if you go to see a doctor for whatever, I guarantee you're coming out with some drugs. It doesn't matter what it is. I guarantee you're coming out. And oftentimes it's the new experimental drugs they haven't used yet. And, you know, the fact that I was listening to a study on um, the new research in medicine and how once they've learned that, let's say, a specific drug isn't actually good um, from the day they learn it and they've proven it in some study, it takes something between seven and 14 years for that drug to actually be approved to market. So, you know, if they have a mistake, it's going to take like seven to 14 years before they even correct the mistake once they are aware of it based on testing. So all you people keep putting your faith in doctors but the fact that, you know, to the point of, you know, we got one in two people now with cancer and the fact that um, for every, as something that I remember Paul Tech said years ago, um, when it comes to surgery, a really, you know, cool stat on surgery, the rate of surgery, surgery increases in direct proportion to the amount of people that have graduated from medical school. That's shocking. So if you, as long as you stand still, they'll operate on you. And a very famous German surgeon, Alf Nackhamsen, um, who's regarded as the best one, you know, one of the best in the world, said in his medical opinion, as a surgeon, 95% of all surgeries should not be taking place because they haven't re met the criteria for actual mm -hmm. surgery. Yeah. I heard that from uh, Dr. Stuart McGill, too. He's a big proponent right. of once again, no absolutes, right? Sometimes you're at the end stage and have double mm -hmm. spondy and you can't even walk and you lost feelings of your leg. Then yeah. you might actually uh, mm -hmm. need surgery at that point. But you also mentioned kind of like 95% of people that have had back surgery didn't even need to have it. Yeah. And a, a decent amount of them actually ended up worse after the surgery exactly. because mm -hmm. they were never taught about like spine sparing movements, how to take care of your body, how to mm. lift properly, how to set up workout routines properly, even move throughout mm. the day properly, even if they're not working mm. out, uh, mm. among a myriad of other things. But yeah, yeah, I mean, you're totally, uh, you're totally right, and um, mm. I hear that hear that pretty often. But what do you think? Um, what do you think? Like one other thing is, well, what do you think? Like, put yourself in in their situation. Like Warren, let's say you're like all of a sudden like a medical doctor, like. How do you justify like a person is coming in in a lot of pain and they're a person, they have feelings, you know, they want to be happy in life too. And they're expressing um, that they're having some issue and you're like, here, just take these drugs, you know, mm. like, um, yeah. I don't know how you would feel about that. I, would... yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, like, like you said, you know, there's a lot of, um, I don't know if you've ever heard the interview with Deepak Chopra and um, Tony Robbins and, um, in the, you know, the start of it, he talks about um, how he was a medical doctor and he was actually the um, the board, the head of board uh, at his at his um, hospital, and he you know he made this joke about how he felt he was just a legal drug pusher, and um, he gave an example of one time he spoke to one of his clients, patients as they like to call them, and said, if you, do you know if you, he was prescribing them all these drugs and he said, you know, if you actually went outside and went for a walk every so often and drunk a little bit more water and, you know, rotated your alcohol, you probably get rid of most of these problems that I'm giving you the drugs for. And he says, you know, my wife says the same thing, but she doesn't charge me 50 bucks. <laughs> you know, he was kind of making a joke about it. And so he said, yeah, he just, that hit him he said yeah i'm just a legal drug pusher so you know something that i know i was taught years ago there are good doctors out there but for every good doctor unfortunately based on the way they're taught there's 20 25 bad doctors that are just working the system and counting their money and something i, I know that you know paul check said was um it's very hard to change your values when your paycheck depends on it mm -hmm. And that is so true of many doctors. Why would they say anything when they're getting backhanded payments and um, for every 
you know, you know, a lot of people, I'm sure you know this, many, many of the viewers might not be aware, but you know, there is they're incentivized to give drugs by the pharmaceutical profession. I know people in the UK that are doctors and they've told me, yeah, they get an extra twenty to forty thousand dollars a year based on the amount of drugs they can get their patients to take. So that's incentive, especially if the economy is as it is right now, where everybody feels the squeeze or the pinch, as they call it, um, in terms of money and being able to survive financially. You would then just dictate, well, my family is more important than the people that I'm seeing. I'm going to take the money. And that's unfortunate. But again, to your point, the system's broken. That's why we even have to have this conversation about doctors, you know, not performing well enough for their clients and not taking the time to educate them because education is power. Well, I feel the other issue is like, um, how do I phrase it? It's kind of a lot of these specialists. Um, and you get this in all sorts of fields, not just in the medical industry, but for example, like, you know, society today for a large extent has become like a swamp of like mental and physical pathology, you know? And a lot of these experts are like really smart and they're, but they're, they're always kind of tinkering on how can we continue to exist in this swamp without actually leaving, but try to optimize our health still, which could actually become kind of complicated. You know, you have so many things that are against you in terms of optimizing your health and kind of counter all of those forces. It does take like some decent thought and strategy to be able to do that successfully. But uh, I feel like, wouldn't it just make more sense to step out of the swamp? Mm. And then all of a sudden, like the healing process is much easier. You know, uh, of course, there's the caveat of, wherever you go there you are so obviously if you're creating your own problems mm. then that's a different story but a lot of times like especially i find with fat loss clients if they um finish a fat loss journey but remain in the same environment where they gained that body mm. fat after mm. their chances of relapse are almost 100 mm. percent um i feel even if you really kind of work at changing their belief system simply because it's kind of the equivalent of like a person that has finished a drug rehab program successfully. And then they go back to the neighborhood with the drug dealer and all their druggy mm -hmm. friends and mm -hmm. all that stuff. I mean, come on, you don't need to be a master psychologist. The chances of relapse is like, Oh, it's very, very high. I'm not going to give a number, but it's, mm -hmm. I, would, I would bet it's probably 90% plus mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of going back to their old habits and stuff of that sort. So I find yeah, just yeah. a lot of, Sorry, no, I was just going to add to that. Just like when you talk about people that have gone to jail, once they get released, the statistics of them re-offending re is high. Um, because like you said, they go back to the same environments and hang out with the same people that kind of um, motivated them or stimulated them or activated them to crime in the first place. It's like if you wanted to change your friends, you change your environment. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just, I, I mean, there are people that, that preach this message, but it's just shocking how literal it is. And I think simply because a lot of these specialists are also deeply dependent on the matrix for their yeah. livelihood. And they just also personally don't know any other way of life. They're born into that system. They're mm -hmm. raised in that system. And now they're get, earning their income from that system. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I don't know if you've ever been to a medical convention, but it's pretty much should be retitled kind of like an obesity and sick convention. Because like yeah. most of the people you see there are just, they look freaking terrible. They look yeah. like they're on their deathbed. There yeah. is like maybe one out of 20 that's on point, like <laughs> one out of 20. Yeah. And that's yeah. far in between. And yeah. I'm like, dude, how, who pays these people for health advice? They know yeah. nothing about health. Exactly. But that's the, again, that's the concrete thinking, you know, this whole thing about lead by example. I think I heard that saying some years ago. And so to your point, that doesn't seem like it's a good reference. You know, I think I said, on the last time when we spoke um, that leaders lead from example. And when we look at the battles of, of the medieval times, you would have the kings riding out on horseback, leading the army, leading the fight by example, that the, the kings could fight. And so they, their, their followers fought because their king could. And so that's a true leader. But unfortunately, today we are being led by those who aren't true leaders. And we're seeing that. I mean, the healthcare minister for... Um, the UK, this lady, she was, I don't know, she was, you know, almost obese, but she was the healthcare minister. And she had shunned, there was a story that went around where she had a go at someone who was talking about eat healthy to, to 
get over all of this COVID stuff. And she shunned him and said he was chatting rubbish and all this sort of stuff. And somebody put a screenshot, a split screen of the two people. This guy, who's in phenomenal shape, looked like an athlete, says, eat good and you'll be fine. And this lady, who looked like Jabba the Hutt, was basically saying, no, just take the vaccine. And they said, who are you going to listen to? The sick person. The lady. Yeah, exactly. That's sick, what they sick do. People, sick people can't make healthy decisions or they wouldn't be yeah. sick to begin with. So, of course, they're going to follow the dumbass, you know? Yeah. And yeah. you know, there's another stat that says that doctors die 10 years before their patients in general. Dude, so, I had one doctor one time try to try to genuinely argue with me why getting 70%, 70, 80% of your total calories from like cereal is a bad idea. <laughs> like they're actually serious. They wanted me to prove to them that that was a bad idea, you know? Wow. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> get this stop. conversation. You know? <laughs> I'm like, man, like, I don't know how you make a living. I just, I, I wanted to ask him. And I'm like, who, pay, who actually pays you, you know? I actually had a doctor one time tell me uh, years ago, um, he said, I said to him, oh, you look, you look quite good, you know, for a doctor. <laughs> you look quite good for a doctor. Um, and he looked decently healthy. And he goes, I was like, so what do you do? And he goes, oh, my secret is I take anodin every day. <laughs> It's a blood thinner, so it's really uh -huh. good for you. And he goes, yeah, you should start. And I was like, all right, I'll keep that in mind. And I just got yeah. out of it as quick as I could. <laughs> yeah, man, I find it so comical. It's kind of like a good example is like, um, I mean, look, I was raised by my grandmother in an off-grid farm for, uh, for about 10 years or so. And oh. uh, honestly, um, I mean, I mean this in the best way. She's like very actually intelligent but not like maybe academically intelligent for example mm. and she didn't even know how to read ba mm. almost didn't even know how to read she knew just yeah. like basic reading and uh i learned more good health advice from her than i have probably learned from outside of like paul check and maybe just a few in fact she kind of like i feel like what attracted me to a lot of paul check's teaching was what my grandmother was teaching she just wasn't so like academic about it you know she could she mm. kind of explain it like academically but she always mm. like explain we obviously lived off uh just the land out in nature all the time having low intensity dynamic movement all day every day mm. i didn't even freaking know what pesticides or gmos were or, like electricity mm. for example or any of that stuff until wow. how like later on in life and so she just naturally just lived that way just because that's how the environment dictated you live just to even get by on a day-to-day -day basis mm. and look she lived to be 87 mm. and she only went to the doctors like one time to give birth to my mom wow. and that's it and she was in full health like her whole entire life and it's kind of like i and then i see like a lot of like super um they are very smart and i don't want to put them under but they just they don't look like they're doing well a lot of health experts you know what i mean and yeah, i think yeah. one of the one of the biggest things is is they're just too plugged in with trying to figure out a way to to survive in the swamp instead of like taking that knowledge and then just moving out of the swamp and then seeing just how easy it is like of course anyone if you train you can probably get the bulk majority of people to climb mount everest eventually but mm -hmm. what's easier, just to go for a walk or climb Mount Everest? Both are doable in a sense, but mm -hmm. just to go for a walk at a park is probably way easier to accomplish. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. If you step out of the swamp, it's kind of like going for a walk in the park. But if you're in the mm -hmm. swamp, it's like having to climb Mount Everest day in and day out, day in and day out. You could do it, but it's like, man, there's just, it's very difficult. And numbers don't lie. Nine out of 10 Americans are metabolically unhealthy now. Mm -hmm. And it's 90%, dude, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Although all of these medical advancements and all of these nutrition books and all of these exercise programs, and it's still tanking. It's like, a, it's like the, the state of the health is like insultingly bad. It's very pathetic. Mm. Yeah. I mean, like you said, you know, to your point, it's the blind leading the blind. And unfortunately, the lowest common denominator is what dictates what we do in general. Like most of um, when we still see in the world where most athletes get their informational condition from bodybuilding magazines that's when we know the lowest common denominator is what dictates and that's an example for the rest of the world whatever is new shiny or big or advertised is typically what's true when we look at the society and we see someone like Thich Nhat Ham or the Dalai Lama has less than four million followers and we have someone like the Kardashians that have over 100 million followers we understand where the world is focusing their attention 
it's not on wisdom or information it's just stimulation and likes and that's where that you know just that example is an example of the world we are not guided by wise people i mean you know like the heroes that we used to have even 30 years ago were typically heroes that were um nobel peace prize winners or gurus of some type and now the leaders of today are rappers and influencers and people that i mean i saw a video of a woman that was um a millionaire from setting up a youtube channel what they call it unboxing videos and someone you're telling me millions of people watch you open boxes that's the attention that we have today rather than sitting with a wise man or woman from a hundred years ago you like the whole the stories of of the wise men that would you know the christian story of a wise man where they would travel hundreds of thousands of miles to sit with the golden child you know the one they call jesus but those stories are true you know there would be people that would go and sit with masters that would travel hundreds of miles to sit because they adored wisdom and insight whereas nowadays we're watching unboxing videos that's the state of the world yeah well what do you feel like um like how old are you now warren younger than you hi everyone thanks for tuning into the podcast i'm curious have you ever been confused by the labels in the grocery store in yevgeny's book he demystifies the difference between caged cage free free range and pasture raised meats he also covers how to avoid gmos source high quality water fish supplements and other related topics it's a beautifully illustrated non-technical read that comes with a comprehensive video series and other extended learning materials. Jump on Amazon and check out the book titled Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide by Evgeny Trefkin. Now let's dive back into the podcast. Okay. <laughs> well, you may look younger than me. <laughs> I look I'm older. <laughs> well, anyway, regardless, but how do you feel like, um, how do you feel looking at your friends and kind of associating with them because I'm pretty sure you've gone a different path than many of them. Yeah. Definitely. And you know, as a kid, you're running around in the playground, everyone's laughing. Everyone's probably way healthier than they are now. Everyone's mm -hmm. kind of like goofy in a sense. And then now it's like, you see a lot of your friends and they're like super overweight. They're like on three or four different drugs. They're mm -hmm. like, look way older than they are. They're kind of like haggard looking and just not, not happy. And, um, they're just okay with it. Yeah, I mean, I remember, you know, sometimes I'd see, um, I, I remember I was training a woman years ago and she said, um, she said, I'm old because I'm 30 or 35 or whatever it was. And I said, no, you're not old because you're 30 or 35. You're old because you haven't exercised in 20 years. That's the difference. So, you know, people get older, as you know, to your point, people get older because of the wear and tear of the bad choices over time as opposed to an age. And so, you know, this whole thing about age is nothing but a number. And it's true. It's There are people that are 50 that look amazing. I've seen, I was watching a video of a guy the other day who was 55 and geez, he looked like he was 28 years old. And is that, I remember something one of, one of my friends said years ago. Um, I mean, she looked like a professional athlete and she was 40, sometime in, in her early 40s. And um, when I was working at a gym years ago, women were intimidated by her. They didn't want to talk to her. Um, and she was an ear stewardess, not an elite athlete, but she looked like a professional sprinter. And I remember her saying, I don't look good for my age. I look normal. It's everybody mm -hmm. else is unnormal. And so she's not the anomaly, you know, she's the norm. And so we've accepted that people look older at a certain age because of what we see in society as opposed to what true health is. Um, I think we mentioned before as well about blue zones. We would talk about blue zones on the planet where they had the, the most naturally occurring century. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so for those who, who haven't heard this before, there are certain points on the planet, um, zones where they have the most centurions per capita in the world, and they have specific things in common. And one of those things, they all have completely different diets, but they eat natural. Um, they all have the same friends they've had for the last 80 years. Um, they all don't exercise because life is movement. Um, and so these are some of the specific criteria that unifies them. And it was movement is natural. They don't sit all day. They walk around a lot. They hang out, sorry about the 
<laughs> siren in the background. It's it's a uh, World War Z. It's yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Didn't that start in the UK? That movie, I forgot. Exactly. Yeah, it was shot in the UK. Brad Pitt, right? Brad Pitt. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's shot in the UK. Oh no, it was um, twenty eight days later. Oh right, yeah. zombie film. Yeah, and then twenty eight weeks later, and then hopefully they're making a new one. I heard they're making a new one, but I don't know. Yeah, I do that. love the zombie type of films. Actually, <laughs> my partner is. I'm probably. You see, zombies seem to be becoming like professional athletes. They started like super slow back in yeah. the yeah, and now they're like track athletes, dude, <laughs> with like really good agility too. You know, like, yeah, shit, man, yeah, you better yeah. be on your A game when the time comes because no <laughs> even chances are, even if you're on your A game, you're not going to make it. You know, <laughs> exactly. They don't get tired. <laughs> they don't. Get tired. <laughs> they don't have any lactic acid buildup, man. They can just go at it for like forty eight mm. hours straight, dude. Full sprint, you know. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yeah. Better have a um, lot of bullets or flamethrowers, man. <laughs> definitely. But, you know, even with that, just, you know, because we brought it up, even with that, like, a lot of the stuff that we know today is, like, a lot of these films are being put out for a reason to kind of let people become so docile that they see, start to act like zombies because, you know, a lot of the people today, as we know, they're at a point where they're 20, 30, 40, and they're moving as if they were moving through treacle, like a zombie. And so we see a lot of these films and it's like, you are mirroring these zombies. Like they can't bend the knees, you know, we don't ever see uh, other than the new zombies, as, as you said, <laughs> but the normal zombies, they're stiff, they move really mm -hmm. slow. That's a lot of humanity. They are almost like zombies. And the other comparison that I've heard recently with the whole, this whole COVID thing as well is, um, humans are becoming very zombified in that they can't think or process information almost like a zombie and so you know there's so much truth in, in tv and we're seeing that mirrored in the society as well most of society is sick or actually i forgot about it saying i haven't said this in years but it's a saying i heard years ago called um vertical disease and it refers to the fact that most humans are dead by the time they're 35 but their corpse keeps walking Oh, 35? You're being optimistic, mm. Will. Yeah, funny, man. What are you? I think like right after college, they start dying quick yeah. after they sell yeah. out, they sell out for a paycheck, you know? Corporate yeah. sellouts. Yeah. I mean, it's, but I did hear that saying like 15, 20 years ago. So I suppose it needs to be upgraded. Yeah. <laughs> you up, update your database, man. Yeah, yeah, it's 2025 now. Being too optimistic. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, there's something else I wanted to say as well with regards to um concrete thinking and humanity and you know the stuff that they believe and how they're easily led um so you know i i saw probably about five years ago a um a scenario a video and that is actually real video. i think i told you this before a real video of a dental clinic and a waiting room and they filmed it like a almost um who i forget what they call it that thing where the candid camera like a candid camera sort of thing and um, so they filmed it and they had, let's say 20 people in, in the waiting room outside of the, the um, dental surgery. Half the people were actors and the other half were real patients. And every two minutes, a bell would go off and the actors would stand up. And so all the patients who weren't actors would also stand up without questioning why. And this drill lasted for quite a while, maybe an hour or two but they sped it up just for the camera. And so what happened was they would keep making, they keep moving the real actors out and replacing them with real people. And then the actors, so let's say it's nine actors and now 11 real people and they'd all stand up. The actors would stand up and the real people would stand up. Eventually it got to the point where there was zero actors in the room and only real people. The buzz would go off and everybody would stand up. And they didn't understand why they were standing up. No one questioned why they were standing. They would literally just stand up for 10 seconds and sit back down because they heard a bell, bing, oh, stand up. Never questioned why. And that shows you how it is easy to indoctrinate and to mm. guide people without questioning. And, you know, to that point as well, something I always say, as a child, you questioned everything. As an adult, you question nothing. I still and question oh yeah to, uh, <laughs> other than us you know you the minority but in general you know yeah. adults just don't question anything and you know as you say being around children a lot you realize they do not stop asking questions to the point where they say shut up stop asking me questions they will yeah. not stop asking questions but once they get to an adult they don't question anything which is sad
Yeah, I find, I don't know if this kind of happened to you, but uh, I think it was like the first wave or the second wave of COVID. I don't know how many waves you guys had in the UK. I think we had like two or three like or whatever. Three or four, um, I actually, uh, maybe like four weeks into it, uh, I actually disappeared into Big Bear. It's kind of like a really wooded. Yeah, yeah, I know where it is. In the mountains. Okay, Lots of yeah. boxes go there. Lots of boxes oh, go there. In training, you, so. You've been there before? No, I've never been there, but I've, because I follow boxing, I know tons of boxes. Oh, yeah. I used to go to Big Bear. And, yeah, it's and really high elevation. Feet. So a lot yeah, of people go and train up there. Yeah. And yeah. I went there and disappeared for like eight months. Uh, I actually was supposed to just go there for two weeks because it was going to be two weeks to flatten the curve. Oh, yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> but then two weeks turned into two years. It must it must have been a typo in the memo. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, meant yeah. to write years, not Zero. weeks. Yeah. So I just like two weeks went by and I'm like, well, shit, it's getting worse. I'll stay up here. Then another two weeks, then another two weeks. Wow. And all I did was I, um, I, lo I, I was lucky to have like a hot tub, a cabin, a steam wow. room in the, in the cabin. What? And uh, I was just working out with like kettlebells in the woods i would go dip mm -hmm. into the cold uh, creek after my workout mm -hmm. every day then go hit up the uh, sauna at night you know stuff of that sort just order mm -hmm. meat from uh, ag um, american grass-fed associations basically like regenerative farm sites and they deliver to mm -hmm. your door and dude that's kind of how i lived and i was post about it and i would post like i haven't mm -hmm. been sick and i feel freaking great i'm actually making gains during mm -hmm. during covid while all the gyms were obviously closed and everyone was losing their mm -hmm. gains etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh i i wasn't even telling people to not get the vaccine but i was yeah. surprised how many people would try to attack me yeah you know what i mean for yeah. for 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 doing that i'm like dude if anything i'm living by like the principles of social distancing to the max and yeah. then on top of that uh doc is funny if there are videos of this online but the guy in charge of the whole vaccine thing here was uh, Dr. Fauci. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're familiar with all of that. And stuff, yeah. before COVID, his whole entire message was like, whenever he would be getting interviewed, it's like, oh, what do I do if there's a virus? Do I get a mask? Do I get like a vaccine? And he's like, no, 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 read, Don't no, do any of no that, need yeah, to yeah. be extreme. Just exactly. do the basics. Use movement as medicine. Eat real food. If you have excess body fat, lose that body fat. Drink water. Sleep well. Take care of your central nervous system, et cetera, et cetera. Now, like, dude, if anything, I'm just following this guy's advice that you guys are blindly following now. And all of a sudden he did like a 180 within mm -hmm. like a year or two year frame, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, dude, that's when, you know, like pathology and society has been normalized. When you have a person that's like super highly inflamed, 40 pounds overweight, uh, telling you, you don't know anything about health. You know what I mean? Yeah. Meanwhile, like, and they're like, oh, like. I trust the science. I'm like, well, first of all, like I actually graduated from uh, the Cox Eye Department at University of California, Irvine, with like a last year, two year GPA of like 3.9 and total GPA of 3.7. And a lot of these like, oh, I follow the science, don't even know how to read an abstract correctly. It's like, no, mm. you just follow like whatever the two minute news bit is on CNN. Exactly. All yeah. the time. Yeah. That's yeah. called being a dumbass. And that's why mm. you're very mm. sick. You feel like shit, you look like shit. Mm. And results mm -hmm. speak for themselves at the end of the day. Were you ever kind of like attacked a little bit, or did you kind of experience never that? Never got attacked. Never got attacked. Um, I suppose it's a little bit. I mean, in the UK, America is like you know the whole thing with gun gun laws and stuff. America is so really whenever they jump on something, they're so on it. England, they're so um, what's the word reserved. Human in England are so reserved. Like example would be like I remember when I was in because I've been to America ten times. And I remember when I was in the cinema watching Star Wars, The Phantom Menace. And um, when Darth Maul ki um, gets killed, people in the cinema are like, ah, yeah, woo! In England, that never happens. Like, it's all muted. It's like very low applause because you're worried about keeping a stiff upper lip. Yeah, mm, I see, you got it. Because of that, you won't get as many people being outwardly challenging other people for choices. So we don't get vilified as much. But that, having said that, I have seen stories in the UK of like an example with a mother, heavily pregnant, like eight month year old mother wanted to go into a shop and the security guard wouldn't let her in because she didn't have a mask. And she said, I'm not wearing a mask because I can't breathe properly and I don't affect my child. He's like, I don't care, you're wearing a mask. And then she got vilified for that online. So I, I do know it happens. Um, it's just not as much as I know in America, they're so extreme about you know the whole christian belief system and following following whatever has been dictated to them which is like you know the whole christian system um sacrifice 
which is what it's based on, you know, the premise of it is sacrifice. And so a lot of people sacrifice their own health because they're bought into a, a system that teaches that and pushes that without actually evidence and stuff like that. So yeah, it wasn't as bad over here. I know some people still getting it over there in America, right? I know they've ramped up specific talks about masks and all that sort of stuff again, whereas it was kind of dropping down. Over here in England, probably 10% of people wear masks now. So they're the minority. I don't know what it's like in America now. Well, it depends on where you live. Like where I'm living, yeah, no one yeah. really cares. Florida right now and Texas are completely different. Yeah. So where I'm also, living, it's like they actually find businesses if they try to wear you a mask, try to get you to wear a oh, mask, wow. you know? I think oh. it's like a $10,000 fine or something like that. Wow. Um, but, well, Warren, this is kind of like a little bit off topic, but have you heard of uh, the trend to kind of moving towards like uh, a cyber sapien race? In the sense that uh, there's technology now being created where they basically take a piece of your skull out and they kind of embed a chip that has like uh, these very small, I don't know what they're called, but micro wires that are just very, very thin wires that go yeah, into your chips. brain. And they're supposed to make you like, comp um, I think process information faster, basically just at the end of the day, make mm. you a more productive circuit in the matrix you know mm -hmm. and uh, i don't what's your take on that transition i have yeah i mean we love and hate yeah we've we've heard about this sort of stuff um the trend towards technocracy as some people are calling it as well um i've been hearing about this sort of stuff for 20 odd years uh, the potential of these things happening obviously people like elon musk are very much into all of this um, AI integration as humans. Um, my thoughts on it is um, pretty much probably the same to you with anyone with any intelligence. Um, yeah, any form of frequency that affects the natural frequency and flow of the universe is going to be a detriment to humanity. And it's the start of an enslavement system. I mean, you know, when we look even biblically, when we look at what's happening now we can see specific things such as the mark of the beast which is the, you know the chip it says it in the bible you know in other holy books so that some chip that would be put in your forehead or in your right hand to be able to shop we know it's already happening in sweden different parts of sweden right now um or switzerland i can't remember which one where or even denmark actually it's one of them countries anyway where they're actually they did a control study of about twenty thousand people are actually buying things with their hands and stuff and that's you know, it's control because now if you're electronically connected to the matrix, as you said, they will be able to turn you off and turn you on whenever they want and make you import. Think of it, or not for you, but you know, for your listeners, think of it like this. If you can download information, they can upload information. Your privacy is mm -hmm. gone. And so um, that means they can also insert information into you. And we've heard so many stories of people that are um, sleepers, sleeper killers that they turn something on they shoot someone and then they say i don't know i don't know why i did it you know so and people say oh, that's too far-fetched it's in a movie but that's why they put it in a movie they did they you know the powers that we create specific information and then they make movies about it so that people can say ah you saw that in a movie such as the matrix ah that's just a film but yeah everybody knows the matrix is real and that's part of the way to control people you know there's a saying i heard years ago which is the best lie is always placed between two truths they have to some out of truth and then give you a lie and you think it's all true. Mm, yeah. I have like I I'm kind of divided about that one, man, because at the same time, I I feel like if uh the human race lived true to its natural means, I mean like I'm all about that, but at the same time, one limiting factor is the dinosaurs were around for like a billion years, but where are they now, you know? Mm. And they live true to their instinct and they're just uh, whatever natural nature and i just mm. feel if technology doesn't improve to a certain extent especially if we don't kind of like for example like colonize other planets just the end is near eventually you know what i mean i don't mm. know what your what, what your thought is it from looking at it from that vantage point yeah i mean i read up a lot of stuff in this a long time ago and they were, they were talking about alternative one two and three and um, basically alternative three was to leave the planet. So there's plans that they've had in place. And um, one of the plans of the, when we say they, we're talking about the elite. Um, one of the plans of the elite in the world is to create enslavement of humanity. And it's easier to rule people with fear as we know. And part of the whole thing with electronic stuff is the ability to rule. And so what's the point of having a world where everybody is a robot? I wouldn't want to live in that world. We, when we look at society and we look at the things that we can do now, that's what we could do 
thousands of years ago when we were left our own devices, we were far more advanced. To that point, I'll say to everybody who thinks technology is an advancement, explain the pyramids to me. Because science still hasn't figured it out. And so we we're supposed to be prehistoric back then, but yet we have the pyramids that nobody can figure out yet. That, you know, I'm sure you've probably learned and, and you know enough about the pyramids. I've studied it intensely. And the fact that just for those listeners, just think about this one point with regards to how much more advanced we were then versus what we are now. And to that point, what I basically mean is when we were in our prime history, living in accordance with nature we were able to access our higher senses um and there are things that we were able to do that we can't do now because we become too human the example of that is the pyramids so scientists have said that like okay let me backtrack all right so the twin towers when they were up in america um they weighed something like a hundred thousand tons one of the pyramids in Egypt, Khufu pyramid, the middle one. That pyramid weighed, weighs 5 million tons. Just put that into context without, you know, cranes and all these sort of things. It's, I don't know how many, 50 times heavier. It's a hell of a lot heavier. And what scientists have found is that the pyramids in Egypt, where they are in Egypt, is the only place in the world dense enough to hold that weight. Mm. how the heck would they have known that the pyramids in egypt there's something called a pyramid inch and it means that um the planet is exactly um 25 or 50 times smaller than the pyramid inch in perfect symmetry the pyramids line up directly on ley lines they line up on the tropic of cancer which is the 32 to 33 degree line around the planet the pyramids in Egypt line up with the Orion star constellation perfectly. There is, I could go on and on and go on. There's so many things mm. about the pyramids. But what it shows is um, the people back then when we were living in our true nature were far more advanced than we are now. The fact that another interesting stat, actually, um, scientists, archaeologists spend more money trying to understand the pyramids annually than, they, than, they, than NASA spends on space travel. Hmm. They're still trying to figure out the pyramids. Why are they investing so much money in a prehistoric society? So I disagree with the fact that we are evolving through technology because we were more advanced back then. There's stuff in the pyramids that shows that we were performing bloodless surgery. Bloodless surgery. Um, you know, the pyramids are older than most people think. Listen to people like Graham Hancock and Rupert Sheldrake, and they'll show you the pyramids are 50,000 years old, not 7,000 or 5,000, like they say. Um, so anyway, my point is, um, when we were living truly in nature and harmonizing, the things that we could do were more advanced than the technology that we have today. We just had to get back to that point of knowing, you know, we all know, if you watch films like Lucy, a great film, if you haven't seen mm -hmm. it, Scarlett Johansson, and, you know, this whole thing about we only access 7 to 10% of our brains. The advancement is not technology advancement, it's connectivity, learning to access higher portions of our mind as the tibetan masters are saying the only way out is in getting deeper into ourselves you know there's stuff with um advanced and advanced meditators where they can um you know stop their heart at will um and you know obviously stuff with people like they can levitate and all this is so many things that we have access to that were are far more advanced than the technology that we're developing today so i don't think we need to go into technology we just need to get back into harmony and then we'll be far more advanced anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I agree for the most part. I was just kind of referencing in the sense that you probably need technology to go travel to another planet, though, you know? Mm, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of um, sacred geometry um, sites that have been built around the world, and I'm sure you're aware of like, you know, a lot of people that, a lot of highly spiritual people that are using the money to generate regenerative farming and um, geom geometric homes that harness the energy of the sun and you know stuff like biogeometry the stuff that they're doing and it's technology but obviously it's technology in harmony with the planet so i mm -hmm. do think we need technology but just the ones that are in harmony the stuff see, that is. is destructive to the planet the ancient egyptians had technology you know very advanced technology the fact that when you look at a thermoscan of the pyramids they are hot they're generating heat which is energy 
So they definitely had technology just in harmony with the planet and obviously things like 5G. There was a documentary I saw in, on YouTube um, some years ago, um, beings, uh, resonance beings of frequency, resonance beings of frequency. And it was talking about five, sorry, 4G, because they didn't have 5G back then. And it's like a two hour documentary. And it just shows you the damaging effects of the technology on the planet. The fact that 90% of a specific bird species in America has died out. 50% mm -hmm. of the bee population and you know all this stuff that has died out. That's all because of technology. So yeah, we don't need it. I mean, we need some of it. I need to watch my Marvel films and my YouTube. <laughs> you know, we need a certain amount of it, you know. Yeah, I guess technology, but I guess a lot of times too, it's not like um it's not what you do, it's how you do it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh and it's easy to it's easy to mis misuse technology for profit these days, especially I mean, like really Huh? No, same yeah, like Nikola Tesla. Yeah. So I know he I don't know too much about him, but from the few documentaries I watched, I know he had like a bunch of he he was able to give free electricity to everyone, but then JP Morgan didn't like that. So they kind of canceled the canceled mm -hmm. the idea because they couldn't charge people for that, obviously, and stuff yeah. of that sort. So yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what do you what's your what's your best prediction, Warren, to close this out? Like um do you feel the the health of of the average individual, the mental and physical health, is going to get better, or is it kind of accelerating just for the worse? I think something that one of my friends said um, last year um, at the apex of all this crap that we've been experiencing that this is always prophecy. There's a book called uh, The Fourth Turning, and um, it talks about all the stuff that's happening in the world and made predictions that. Um, I think the book came out probably 20, 30 years ago. And it talked about that every four or 5,000 years, we go through a massive global um, ch um, challenge, some form of global stress point that forces us to reinvent ourselves in a positive way. And um, it predicted that by 2020, we would go through something. And that's what happened. We went through something. And so my point on that is that we always have to go through a massive crisis tipping point to make change positively happen. And my friend said, she believes that things have to get so bad for humans to truly take a look at themselves and say, we have to change the way we're doing it. I know we've been saying this for years and years and years, like mm -hmm. green peace and um, we are the world, that concert that came out years ago, we are the children, all those things, and nothing ever changed. It wasn't bad enough. This global fake crap that they've been inventing and the fear that is created, that's what I've seen has made a change because for me, whether you change proactively or reactively, so long as you change, that's the most important thing. And so I've witnessed, and I'm sure you have as well, because of people's frustrations, they have had to gain the level of awareness to make a better or different decisions than you'd have expected. There are people I just did not think would, would push away from this whole vaccine mandate stuff and go into research and healthcare in a natural way, but they've had to because they've been pushed into doing it rather than us being wanting to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I think enough people have been so frustrated by the restraints on the planet, it's backfired on the powers that be. And now we know and we're seeing that more and more people, you know, like business-wise, like on the stuff I've been doing this last week in the business course, they're talking about how the wellness industry is right now making a billion dollars a day. A billion dollars a day. They say on average, because it's about 340 billion a year. And they say that by 2028, the self-development or you know, industry, as they're calling it, is on track to make a trillion dollars a day. It's the only industry right now that's growing exponentially. So we know from that, it means more and more people are getting into health. So for me, based on that, we're in a positive uprise when it comes to conscious awareness and moving towards health. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, are there any, um, are there any other topics you'd like to cover on top of your, your mind right now? Um, I mean, the only thing I'd probably say is, you know, cause obviously we spoke about a lot of stats and statistics and doom and gloom stuff. And, you know, definitely finishing on the possibilities and potentials that we have as humanity. I'd only say that when we look at, change um only two things can happen with change one you change and grow or two which is the sad part is you go further into denial 
because in order for you to be faced with change, what stops you is denial. And denial generates internal dialogue. And you have to keep using internal dialogue to justify the bad choices that you make. And mm -hmm. so for us to be able to change that, we have to go through those four stages of, of, of awareness, which is conscious incompetence. And the example for that would, if we used exercise, you would do curls and you'd be at the gym and your friends would be like, go on, Dave, keep going. And you would do, you know, leaning backwards and swinging the barbell and, um, you know, cheat curls as a lot of people call it. And then one day a really well-trained practitioner comes in and says, you know that the way, if you keep doing that, you're going to get back pain because you're hyperextending your back and you're on your tiptoes and all this sort of stuff. So now that person gets to the stage of, conscious incompetence rather than unconscious incompetence now they're at conscious incompetence because they've been told what they're doing is wrong and so then eventually they say right i need to hire someone to teach me how to do it right okay now you're at conscious competence because now you're aware you're thinking about it and you're doing it right and then eventually it becomes so habitual you now get to unconscious competence you don't need to think about it, it happens naturally and so that progressive stage is really we have to go through for me for everyone in the, in the western world and obviously part of that is journaling part of that is getting into nature as you said grounding yourself um open your mouth and speak to people if you're in pain we know that 400 percent increase in men when it comes to suicide because men don't talk um so start communicating your pain to other people um you will realize greatly that people can give you great advice, even if they don't follow it. And most people sadly don't follow their own advice, but at least you'll get an advice if you're in pain. So start speaking out, talk to people, get into nature and understand what we said earlier, every problem carries with it its own solution. So if you want to be healthy, do the opposite of what made you sick. And it's really that simple. If you drink alcohol, don't drink alcohol. <laughs> if you don't exercise, start exercising, do the opposite. And if you do that, you'll start to shift some of your negative habits into conscious competence and then eventually unconscious competence. And then as that happens, as they say, a high tide raises all boats. So if you do that, everyone in your spectrum will start to see the results and do it also. And that's how we as individuals making individual choices can affect the whole. Yeah, cool. All right, Warren. Well, thanks for thanks for being a guest again. For the listeners that don't know, I totally messed up the recording the first time. So this isn't actually our first time talking, but it's always uh, always great to have you on. Hopefully we can kind of chat sometime sometime later in the future. Yeah. Because 20 I years and we'll see how your predictions have come true. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, I'm going to get you on my podcast as well. So, yeah. yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining as well and have a good weekend. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. If you've ever had trouble losing weight, or you've lost weight, but still didn't have the ideal body or health you're aiming for, please feel free to reach out anytime and book an assessment. Eugene will work with you to cover your goals in detail, see what's holding you back, and go from there. In the meantime, feel free to check out the countless testimonials on Eugene's website in the link below. In the testimonial section you'll notice everyone has various backgrounds, are of all different ages, and all have had different challenges in their life, but they all have one thing in common, they were all able to find their health and achieve their ideal body. You're also welcome to add yourself to the Facebook group in the link below. There you'll have access to the live videos that Eugene does weekly on Sundays and other helpful content. Thank you again for tuning in.